Good evening, folks. Um, we're going to get started. Um, it's about five after seven, so we'll get started and we will move through this. Thank you. Um, we are going to ask everybody to hold their questions till the end so we can get through the presentation. There's a lot of information. We will leave plenty of time for questions. Um, we just want to be able to get through the entire presentation before we, we get to those. So, um, my name is Mike Dolan. I'm the vice chair of the building committee, as well as um, chair of the communication working group for the committee. Uh, this is our last final public presentation before the vote um, on the 19th. We will be holding three coffee hours as well next week. Monday, Tuesday, and Wednesday at Better Bean from 9 to 11. We invite anybody to come down, buy yourself a cup of coffee, have a seat, chat with us. Um, we'll be answering questions one-on-one -on -one there. If you have any questions here that you don't feel comfortable asking in front of the group, by all means, come down Monday, Tuesday, or Wednesday, and we can, we can chat about it then. Um, so the committee is here. Um, we're going to hear from a few folks tonight. Um, Mr. Swenson, Superintendent of Schools, Shane Nolan, who's our OPM, our Owners Project Manager, which is Daedalus, um, and Gene Raymond, who is from Raymond Design. He is the architect for the project. We're also going to hear from Councillor Loesch. Uh, Mr. Dutton was scheduled to be here tonight to talk about some things um, in the slide presentation, but was called away, so Ms. Loesch has graciously uh, stepped up and We'll be covering some of the slides as well, so give her give her some leeway. <laughs> um, so we'll start with Mr. Swanson. Thank you, Mr. Dolan, thank you everybody for being here. Um, we're just going to kind of walk you through, obviously, where we have been um, to this point through the feasibility stage. Um, <clears throat> what is being proposed uh, is a new 132. Um, 102,013 square foot pre-K through two uh, grade level that meets all the educational requirements to serve students throughout the Bridgewater community. Uh, why the new construction at 500 South Street? Well, after our feasibility study, uh, several renovation addition and alternative site options. Uh, the Bridgewater School Building Committee exercised due diligence and voted to move forward with option C61 um, to best fulfill the goals in meeting the educational needs of our students for a lower cost and an actual renovation uh, addition option. What is the reason for the size and cost? Uh, the Mass Building um, School Building Authority, or MSBA, which you'll be hearing throughout this presentation uh, this evening, and the Mass Department of uh, Elementary and Secondary Education provide recommendations and requirements for size and number of teaching, learning, resources, and administrative spaces. The estimated cost of this project is based upon the value of construction materials, labor, including anticipated escalation costs for the anticipated start of construction should the vote go forward on the 19th of 2020. The, uh, Sorry. Our uh, community and, and our children design principles for the new Mitchell Elementary School included flexible and appropriate classrooms, classroom space, uh, so centers of cooperative learning that could be part of the daily routine, outdoor learning space, which uh, was an important part of this to create connections to outdoor classrooms, gardens, recreation, and resource spaces. Personalization and connection of ownership, visible learning, the whole child, STEAM and STEM, which you're going to be hearing throughout the project, uh, throughout the presentation this evening, project-based learning. Adaptable spaces to create fle flexible spaces, um, extended learning, and uh, display in transitional spaces. Sustainability, obviously that was an issue in our uh, last building, and that focuses on environmentally friendly practices, materials, natural light, and fresh air, and cooperative and collaborative spaces to create common areas to work together in the uh, common space and community spaces. 
Thank you, Raymond, our women designer. Great. Um, thank you, Derek. So uh, I'm here as a resource tonight um, to, uh, I'll, I'll tell you a little bit about the, the way the building's organized, but um, I imagine we probably have a lot of other questions. But anytime, whenever you get to the end of, uh, end of the presentation and you have any questions about either the old Mitchell, uh, the new proposed Mitchell, anything from a technical uh, or layout perspective, anything on the site, um, feel free to feel free to uh, bring it up. So all those um, items that Derek had just rolled through, they're all um, they're all came out of the visioning uh, process that took place over a few months uh, at the beginning of the um, the process. And that included, you know, uh, teachers, students, uh, uh, administrative staff, uh, building professionals, educational professionals, um, and they really embody uh, the kind of features that are related to a 21st century educational program. And when you know any of us here went to elementary school what's being done across the commonwealth and actually across the country is schools are, are being organized and built completely differently uh, because the needs of the educational program are much different than they were we used to just go in and get lecture to and take tests right now uh, there's a huge focus i think rightly so based on where the economy is going on project-based learning social <coughs> skills being able to work in teams being able to self-direct work, et cetera, et cetera. So um, the building that's being proposed is something that can uh, handle all those things and, kind of, and is kind of set up to uh, make those things happen. Uh, the building is um, at the Mitchell uh, site, so the old Mitchell would come down that school was in the middle of the site and it had access only from South Street, from buses, vans, and, um, and cars. So uh, site-wise, it was kind of in the wrong place and there was a lot of uh, congestion on the site which spilled onto South Street, which already has to deal with Williams. So that's one of the things that the new school would solve. Uh, it's an L-shaped building. There's a, there's a wing that goes up and a wing that goes left to right. Uh, and we've kind of tucked it on the on the edge of the site. Uh, all, the, all the cars and buses will still come in from South Street, but instead of the buses going back out South Street, they're going to go out the rear of the rear of the um, site past the senior center uh, twice a day. Um, the uh, there's two full stories that are that are this L shape, and then under under this part of this wing is uh, a ground floor uh, area, which is really what we're calling the community access wing. Uh, it's kind of like it's a walkout. The old Mitchell, if any of you know it, you entered in at the upper level and you could walk out at the bottom level uh, because the site slopes. So what's down at this uh, in the community wing is uh, a cafetorium with a kitchen, uh, a gymnasium, and the music rooms that uh, kind of support a stage which are in the middle of those two spaces. And the reason we're calling it the community wing, it's obviously a huge part of the school program, but the way the building's organized, uh, people will be able to, you know, anyone, after school, weekends, summers, will be able to get in uh, this exit or entrance and make use of this and not be able to get anywhere in the rest of the school where the educational spaces are. So the front entrance and the, and the main lobby in this present area is the administrative suite. That's all up at South Street. When you come into from South Street, you know that's the level you'd be going into. There's a pre-K wing. There's a uh, kindergarten uh, kindergarten wing. Then there's a first grade and a second grade, and some shared spaces in these uh, other other colors. So there's uh, 42 <coughs> classrooms. There's uh, 17 other rooms that are based on, uh, you know, special needs and, and teaching to the to the level of a child. There's six art, music, and project-based rooms, um, and then all the other things that you'd expect in a school. But again, it's all focused 
on delivering that that 21st century education program. So, uh, I think we're excellent. Paul oh, Wyatt. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, about that. Hi, it's Gene. Um, so I'm Shane Nolan. I'm the owner's project manager from Davis Projects, and bring you through some slides here. Before um, before I start, I just want to mention Derek. Derek had mentioned the, the MSBA, that's the Mass School Building Authority. The, uh, the district is partnering with the MSBA on, on this project. The MSBA is a state agency that uh, contributes and partly funds school projects in Massachusetts. And so that will come up uh, throughout this. But so the MSBA are partnering with us. They will reimburse eligible project costs for this project, and uh, that will come up as a state agency. Their, I would say their, uh, their program is a, a nice entitlement program. About 80 uh, cities, towns, and districts apply to the MSBA for, for funding through their uh, capital projects um, every year. Only about 12 to 14 of those actually get accepted into the program. So it's a non entitlement. It's based on, it's based on a needs basis. The MSBA uh, reviews every application they get and they take uh, the most needy schools and that's the schools that they were from. So we were, we were uh, one of about 14 out of, out of 80 schools that, uh, that submitted and got invited into this program for reimbursement. Um, so the benefits of the, the new school project, uh, the MSBA participation. Um, MSBA will reimburse about 40% of the total project costs. The town's reimbursement rate is it's more than 40%, is actually about 59.28% is the, the total reimbursement rate. But MSBA only reimburses certain eligible costs. They don't reimburse every project cost. So when we when we do the math, we, we, we go through their budget process, it ends up that the, uh, the town will receive a bit 40% of the project costs from MSBA. Um, property size classrooms. Uh, Derek spoke about the, the, the need for uh, teaching in a 21st century building. Again, with the MSBA, we're, we're in their program. They have certain guidelines, regulations we have to follow. There's certain sizes for classrooms. There's certain sizes for gymnasiums, certain number of music room, art room, and other, uh, other um, communities like that. So we're uh, going to property size classrooms, and other classrooms in the existing building were, were undersized. Um, the building will be energy efficient. Uh, one of the, the things with MSBA, MSBA require you to be LEED compliant or um, mass chips compliant. There are two, there are two uh, energy efficient programs. You choose which one you want to do. We chose LEED, which is energy, so leadership in energy and environmental design. Because we're following that, we will be 20% uh, more efficient than the current state code says we need to be. And also because we're following that, and we will get that certification, MSBA gives an additional 2% reimbursement. So, so the, uh, the state has actually given us more money to exceed the energy code in, uh, in the state. Um, talk about some of the accessible spaces. Uh, this building will, will be used as a school primarily, but there will also be the opportunity to use, a, use it as a community building. Uh, there will be a separate entrance that we can uh, bring the community in after, uh, after school hours. We have to use the gymnasium, the cafeteria, and there's other rooms on that bottom level that Jean showed you that will be able to be used for uh, community uses. Um, one of the problems with the existing um, school is there's three, there's three entrances in the three, three schools, as they call them, the three fingers in that school. This new design, this new school will have one single entrance. There'll be a secure entrance. Uh, People will not be able to enter the school without uh, going in through a a, um, an intercom. They'll get into a school vestibule where they'll present their credentials, and if, uh, if everything checks out, they'll then be allowed into the school. So there's two checks before anybody from the public can get into the school, much more secure than what uh, one is there today. And, uh, and then finally, um, as we said, the, uh, the services will be consistent with the state and local uh, requirements that meet the educational needs. That's what the MSBA, also the, the Department of Elementary and Secondary Education, uh, as part of this process, Derek uh, and the school department had to write a full educational program, not just for this school, but for the entire district, to show that this new school will fit into the entire district's educational program. That was reviewed by MSBA, that was reviewed by another state agency, the uh, Department of Secondary, Elementary and Secondary Education, and they approved this project to, uh, to move forward to the funding stage. 
Um, so there's been a, a lot of questions as we've gone through this process. The, uh, the Mitchell School is, is, is not, the existing Mitchell School is not very old in, in terms of building life. And it's had its issues, that's been well documented. So a question that keeps coming up is, how do we know that the school won't have the same problems as it did in 1996, uh, after it opened up, until the, uh, the roof collapsed a couple of years ago? Um, in 2004, there was uh, construction reform laws brought in in Massachusetts. That, that uh, was brought in after a whole review of the entire public construction process in Massachusetts. And with that, it brought a number of requirements that now all public pro projects are required to, to follow. And one of those is the requirement for an owner's project manager. And that's the role our firm uh, provides to the town. Any public project over $1.5 million is required to have an owner's project manager who represents the town and the town interest alone on the project. And that's what we've been hired to do here. And the town also brought in a standard process for designer selection. And after we were hired, we worked with the MSBA and, and the district to send out a request for qualifications to architects. And unlike the process where we were hired, the town was not allowed to hire their own, their own architect. That was done through the MSBA design and selection panel, which consists of 15 people, 12 of whom were representatives from the district and 12 of whom were representatives from the state. So in order for Gina and his firm to be uh, to be qualified and appointed for this, they had to go through a whole series of, of presentations, submissions, and interviews before they were uh, they were heard and made sure they were the right people and uh, qualified for this. Um, there's a requirement for certification of file subcontractors and general contractors. Um, in, in, in prior to 2004, anybody could, could bid on these projects. There was a low bidder got the job. So anybody who wanted to bid this would come in submit a low number, and uh, they would cut corners, they would look for change orders that maybe weren't uh, reasonable or justified. With the, the new law after 2004, every company bids on public work has to be certified with the state. Um, that's the five subcontractors. There's 18 uh, subcontract trades. There's masonry, miscellaneous metals, windows, roofing, uh, ceramic tile, fire protection, plumbing, HVAC, electric, I'm missing a couple, but a number of those, they all have to be certified by the state to be allowed to uh, bid on this project. Also with the general contractors, the general contractor has to be uh, certified by the state to bid on this project. Yeah. But that's not, that's not all. So not only do they have to be certified with the state, they then have to go through a process with us, with the designer, to actually pre-qualify for this project. Every project they have to pre-qualify individually. So even though they have a certificate that says they're certified by the state, we still review all their information from the last five to 10 years of construction. We go out, we get references on all these subcontractors, general contractors, and only if we say they're pre-qualified, will they be not bid on this. So it'll be a small group of uh, contractors who are bid on this to go through a process before they're allowed to come on board. Um, I just talked about the owner's project manager. So as I said, we represent the, the, the district and the district alone. Uh, we don't design the building, we don't build the building. We, we represent the district. Uh, I've been on board, I've been coming to weekly meetings with Regine and, and people from the district for about the last 18 months as we brought this through the schematic design. We'll continue to do that through the full design, through bidding. And then when this project starts construction, we'll have a full-time site representative on site. We'll be there every day reporting who's working, what they're doing, what equipment was on site, and the issues that came up and how those issues were resolved. That site representative will also ensure that any inspections that are required by the state or by the architect and engineer specifications are done before the contractors are allowed to continue to work. And on top of that, the, the MSBA will have a project manager who will come and they'll uh, tour the site with us once a month to make sure that we are actually doing it for, for the agreement with the state and with the MSBA. So there'll be uh, eyes on it from, uh, from the MSBA once a month or so. Um, so, uh, testing and inspection requirements. Uh, the code has changed, I believe, three times since the, uh, the, the Mitchell building was originally built. The Mass State Building Code now requires a number of testing and, tests and inspections to be carried out by a third party inspection company. 
So again, as your agent, we'll uh, go out, we'll, we'll procure that, we'll bring somebody on board to do tests, to test the soil, to test the concrete, to test the structure of steel, we'll do tests on the roof, we'll do tests on the windows, we'll do a number of tests to make sure that each element of that building is uh, constructed correctly and is ready for occupancy. On top of that, MSBA uh, fund 100% commissioning agent. The commissioning agent will review the design of the building right through the unit, the different phases of design, and then when construction starts, they'll come out, they'll do periodic inspections, and then before the building is handed over to the owner, the commissioning agent will test and inspect all the H5, all the plumbing, and all the electrical systems to make sure that they're working correctly, and they'll also make sure that the town's facilities department gets the uh, correct training and um, can, can use those uh, systems. They, uh, they, can, um, they have the, the O&M, the Operation and Maintenance Manuals. They have all the documentation to take over that building, use it, occupy it, and uh, continue to uh, use it in an effective manner. So our, uh, our schedule. Um, we've, we've been, as I said, we've been working on this project for about 18 months. Uh, the project, uh, the building committee had been in place for about 12 or 18 months before that, so it's been about a three year process to get to where we are now. Um, that, that process um, finished, or was it finished, but it, it, it stopped at the uh, MSBA board meeting on August 28th. That's when we reached the major milestone of this project, which was the, uh, the schematic design. Uh, Representatives of school went to, went to the MSBA board meeting. The MSBA board is chaired by the state treasurer, uh, Ted Goldberg. And um, at that meeting, the MSBA and their board approved this project and issued what's called a project scope and budget agreement. That says that the state is going to fund the project uh, 37 million or so, which I'll in a minute, as reimbursable costs if the town approves the project and they come to vote. So right now we have an agreement with the state that says that they will fund this project on the condition that the town approves the project on October 19th when it goes to the town ballot. And so we hope to have all those approvals in place by, by uh, October. It's a little hard to read, that's the, the, the blue bar there. And if we do get those, we'll move straight into our, our uh, detailed design phase. And there's three phases in detailed design. There's design development, that would take about four months. At the end of design development, we'll take the architect's uh, design. The architect will do a cost estimate on it, and our company will do an in-house cost estimate as well to check the architects to make sure we're still on budget. We'll take those two estimates, we, we reconcile them to make sure we're in agreement, we're on budget. We we'll also submit that to the MSPA. If MSPA approves it, it allows us to go to the next phase of design, which is called 60% construction documents. Gene's team will continue to, to evolve the design. At the end of 60% construction documents, we'll do another cost estimate. We'll do two cost estimates, we'll reconcile again, make sure we're on budget, submit it to the state, the state approves it, we move forward to what's known as 90% construction documents. At the end of 90% construction documents, we'll do a final cost estimate. So there'll be three cost estimates on this project before we go to bid to make sure we're on budget. We as your project manager won't let it proceed if it's not on budget, and the state will not let us proceed. So three cost checks over the next uh, 10 months or so to make sure we're on budget before we go to bid this project. After that, we'll go to bid. It will take about two months to bid the project. Uh, we'll hire a contract for some time, late, late 2020. We hope to start construction. And construction will take about 18 to 20 months. So we're looking to finish construction uh, sometime in the summer of 22 and up and up in September of 2022. Um, we wanted to talk a little bit about the, the costs. Um, as part of the work that we've done today, we've, we've looked at a number of options. We looked at uh, renovating the existing building. We looked at renovating and uh, building an addition to the existing building. We also looked at new construction at uh, 500 South Street, as well as new construction at some other sites around town. Um, these are just a couple of questions. A uh, uh, question keeps coming up is, well, why don't we just renovate what's there? Well, when we look at what it cost to renovate, we found out it was actually close to or even a little more expensive than building a new building. Uh, part of that is because of the issue with the roof, this wouldn't be a standard renovation. Uh, we have to take the whole roof off this building. Usually in a renovation, you'll take the, the shingle off the roof or the rubber roof, you'll keep the structure and you can put a new roof on. 
we have to take the entire structure and all of this. There's also issues with the exterior walls in this and that over there. There was moisture penetrating through through the walls into the building, leading to some environmental issues in the building. So we would have had to take all the, the brick off the building and rebuild that with correct insulation, correct uh, vapor and moisture barriers. So it ended up that it was going to be uh, even more expensive to renovate the building than, than to build new. At the end of the process, the, uh, the school building committee elected to go for what we call the C6 option, which is a new building on the, uh, the existing Mitchell site, which Gene just uh, presented to you a couple of slides ago. Um, so staying on the theme of costs, uh, we, we, we have a project budget that's been submitted to, to MSPA. It's been presented and approved by the school building committee. It's been submitted and approved by the MSPA. So what, what is that project budget made up of? It's made up of uh, two, two things, or two, two categories, soft costs. Uh, soft costs are typically uh, anything that's not bricks and mortar, anything that doesn't go into building the building. So soft costs includes the OPM fees and the architect's fees. It includes any general uh, administrative costs, you've got legal fees, printing for the bidding, advertising for, for contractors, and other miscellaneous items. Uh, there's also other miscellaneous project costs, utility costs, we have to bring in a new gas service, a new electric service, communications, Verizon and Comcast, and so that, that's included in the miscellaneous costs. Permitting, if we have to go through a permitting process with the, uh, with the town for their, their planning department, their contract, any third party inspections, or reviews will be included in that. Moving costs, when the building opens, we've got to bring the kids back to 500 cents. That's all included in there. The testing and inspections that I mentioned a couple of slides ago, and uh, that's included in those costs. And then you have the fixtures, the furniture fixtures and equipment. That's all the tables, chairs, desks. Um, it's uh, all your, your science equipment, your music equipment, your, your gym equipment. It's all your computer and IT equipment. So that's all included in what we call the soft costs. Then we have the, uh, the hard costs, which are, are essentially the, uh, the bricks and mortar. That's everything that the general contractor will do. It includes the, the demo, the, uh, the general contract for the new building, the, 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 mace, the uh, masonry, the brick, the windows, the roof, uh, the interior walls, the floor finish, the ceiling finishes, and all the remaining pieces. So it includes site work. Um, we're going to redo the whole site, uh, make it more friendly for, in terms of traffic, in terms of recess in terms of site immunity for the kids and for the public to use when this project was done. And uh, just here, we uh, go back to those five subcontracts that I, I mentioned. These are the uh, trades that we want to go through for the five subcontract. They're all part of the hard construction process. Um, so what is our project budget for, for, for this project? Um, our total project budget is 80,600,000. So that's made up of a feasibility study, which was 800,000. That 800,000 has already been appropriated by the town. That was what funded the feasibility and schematic design to get us to, to this point today. So that's already been, been proven and funded by the town group. Then we have our construction budget, the hard cost, which is just under uh, 64.7 million to fill the school. We have our, our soft costs, as I said, the OPM, the architect, FF, any other miscellaneous costs. 11,380,000. And then we have contingencies built in. Um, on these projects, there's always unforeseen uh, things come up during the project, things come up during the designs. We have contingencies to make sure that there are no overruns. These will include design contingencies as the design progresses, includes contingencies for escalation, for, for price, and uh, for material and labor costs. Um, and it also includes a contingency for the the construction of the contractors actually outside from the zone for seats. So that number is about 3.7 million, bringing us to a total of 80 million 600,000 for the total project budget. And um, that's the bad news. The, the good news is the, this is where the MSBA comes in. So the MSBA has agreed to, to fund, as I said, 59.28% of eligible costs. Eligible costs is the number of caps they include. Uh, the cost of construction at $333 per square foot. It includes the cost of your site work, which is 80% of your construction. It includes caps on, on our fee, on the designer's fee. It includes caps on the reimbursable fit furniture, fixtures, and equipment. Uh, so we don't, we, 
we're unable to, and we're not expected to fit the whole budget cost into those caps. Those caps are set by MSBA so they can disperse money to other cities, towns, and districts across the Commonwealth in a fair way. So when we do that, we take a calculation and our effective reimbursement rate ends up at just under 42 percent. That includes those incentive points I said for the uh, for the um, the lead accreditation two percent. So with that, the MSBA were reimbursed up to a maximum of $33,822,000 for this project, leaving the town's anticipated share at 46,771,887. Uh, keep in mind that number includes 800,000 that's already been appropriated to, uh, to fund the schematic design. Um, so we've just illustrated here on this uh, slide some, some other elementary schools that uh, are currently around the same phase as us in, in, in the design phase uh, and what those costs are. So, so we've included uh, the Brightwood School in Springfield, the, the Wynum Forest in Wareham, the Ballmer School in uh, Northbridge, Federal School in, in Harvard Mass, the Beale School in Shrewsbury, and the Davis School in Tewksbury. Uh, and you can see our school fits right, right in the middle of those ranges from about $445 a square foot right up to $555. So we're right in the middle. So we're right where, where we, would, we would want to be in that. And right in line with other MSBA and uh, school projects in the company. Um, this is, a, this is a, a graph that's a little hard to see. This is taken right from the MSBA's website. Uh, you can see that the construction costs in Massachusetts have been rising steadily over the last uh, this goes back to 2009, so you can see they've been, they've been running. These lines here show some of the other cost indicators, but you can see this line here is construction costs for schools in Massachusetts, which are outpaced by, by quite a lot and other, other consumer indexes for prices. But, but right now, we're, we're here, so we're right on line with uh, where we should be, right line with many of the other schools in the, uh, the MSP program. That all works to talk. So the vote on October 19th is going to be for a debt exclusion, which means that eventually this debt will come off the books. We have currently um, several bonds throughout the district, um, throughout the school district, that are currently on the books that over the course of the history of this uh, debt exclusion, should the vote go forward, um, on October 19th would eventually come off the books. Um, three uh, at the high school, which were two bonds for the physical plant themselves and one for the access um, of, of the land. The additional new high school bond, the 12 million number, uh, will be off the books as of uh, 2028. We have a smaller note that will be coming off the books, uh, that 2 million number. Uh, 2033, and then the land um, acquisition uh, number will be coming off the books as of uh, 2025. We had a remodel to the old high school, which is currently the Mitchell at the Middle, which was the former uh, Bridgewater Middle School. And with that uh, remodel, about a, the debt of about uh, $1,391,750, and that will be coming off the books as of uh, 2028. We did have a roof project a few years ago that we actually went through the MSBA. It was an accelerated uh, project that we um, worked with MSBA and received that uh, reimbursement rate of 55% at that point. The uh, roof had a little under a million dollars left on that, um, and that will be coming off the books as of 2033. The Williams Intermediate School on 200 South Street had some renovation work done uh, in the early 2000s, and again, that uh, that would be rolling off as of uh, 2029. Finally, and I know this is a difficult one for folks uh, within the town to kind of absorb, there's actually still um, a bond on the Mitchell School that is down on 500 South Street of about $768,015, and that will actually be coming off the books as of uh, 2000. Um, 25, which would be about uh, three years after uh, the opening of, of the new site, should uh, the vote go forward on October the 19th. And I know that we also have some debt that will be rolling off the books from, from the town side.
I was joining you all here today as a mom at the vigil, um, so I wasn't fully expecting to be in my town councilor role, but here I am. So I'm going to go over some of the town debts that we have and how it's all going to affect you directly. So as you can see on the slide, we have had some things come off over the past um, 10 years or so from the fire refund that fell off in 2011, um, the 2001 school project refunding, 2014 school refunding, as well as um, the police building. So those have all already fallen off. What we have left is the fire station roof rehab is about 75,000. The memorial building is at 350,000. The academy building where we host our town council meetings are is at 2.4. Um, left on it, the land acquisition of Hog Farm is at zero. Um, we also have a 2012 ambulance at 56,000. Um, a fire engine at 2000, from 2012 at 260,000, and then two smaller ones of the refunding of the department equipment at 11,000, and lastly, the highway equipment at 15,000. So when you see the large dip that's happening from the top to the bottom, that would be the projected graph of what we would owe over the next 10 to 15 years for the existing debt. So what does that mean for you? Um, the average cost is $324 per home, with the average home cost being $385,759. So as you can see in the beginning, it goes up. We'll kind of hit that median mark, and then it'll start to go down over the 25 years. Um, so I know it's a little hard to see. We'll be sure to share this with you more closely. Um, but the actual math behind it, if you were to take your home, if it's worth more than 385000 that we're using as a town average, you would take the um, $1,000 per rate minus year one and kind of get that uh, decimal of the dollar twenty, and you'd be able to calculate your costs there for your home. Um, so the example shows a $450,000 home times $1,000 times the rate would give you $541 versus the uh, the average 324, but again, that is an average cost that we're thinking about per resident. Okay, so I'll pass it back to talk about what a yes and no looks like for the town. Um, so uh, the town votes on October 19th to, uh, to see if this project will go to <coughs> So what does a, uh, what happens if there's a yes vote? There's a yes vote, we, we move forward with the full design uh, of this project. We sign a project funding agreement with the state. We will design, build, build the project. Uh, we will pre-qualify general contractors, as I mentioned before. Um, we'll look to start construction sometime in the summer of 2020 and expect to open the building for uh, September, August, September 2022, when uh, teachers and kids will will occupy the building. Um, what happens if it's a no vote? Um, this language is taken right from the MSBA's website. A, a failed vote will likely result in the school district being required to submit a new statement of interest and await an invitation from the MSBA. As I mentioned, the MSBA receives 100, uh, 80 to 100 um, statements of interest every year for schools who are looking for funding. They approve of about 12 to 14 of those. If the school, uh, is, if the, uh, the vote does not pass to fund this school, uh, the district will likely be taken out of the program, you will lose that reimbursement, and you'll have to go back out to the pool of other uh, cities, towns, and districts in the state, resubmit, um, and even resubmitting, uh, the fact that you're in there does not guarantee that you will get in next year, the year after, or some other future day. So you risk losing that, uh, that um, reimbursement from the state. Um, with, with the way construction is now, uh, construction is booming. Uh, it's taken us three years to get to this process. We're still about nine or 10 months out to actually bidding this if the project does pass. So if you add about four years of escalation uh, and cost increases in construction from where we are today, we did have to start this process again. Construction prices are likely going to be much higher and the school will cost a lot more to build four years time than it would uh, if we start to design and build this year or, uh, or in 2020. Um, so as you've heard multiple times and if 
obviously know already. Our vote is Saturday, October 19th at the Mitchell at the Middle, uh, Bridgewater Middle School, former high school, um, 166 Mount Prospect, whatever you choose to call it, that's where the voting happens. Um, from 7 a.m. to 8 p.m. Um, so that is that. We do have a website, a Facebook page, and an email address. Again, if you have any questions, you think about something tonight, and you say, oh, I should have asked, by all means, email us. We will respond within 24 hours. Um, we've gotten many emails from folks, um, and we've responded um, to answer the information. I want to start by letting you all know, or end, I should say, by this presentation will be online, but we'll be handing out hard copies tonight. Uh, we wanted everybody to really focus on what was on the screen and what was being said versus flipping through the pages. So um, we'll hand those out now. We'll open it up for questions. We realize this room is going to be split, some yes, some no. That's OK. You are here to get the information. We appreciate that. We appreciate you coming and getting the information and learning about the last three year process. So all I'm saying is please be respectful of the other opinions in the room. If you don't share them, that's fine. You're entitled to that. We all are. Um, just sort of be respectful of that. So they'll be handing those out along with some trifolds. Um, so questions uh, for anyone on the committee? Uh, questions? Anything? Yes. First of all, congratulations on all your hard work. It takes a lot of people, a lot of time and effort, and it looks as if you've been working on it. I have to be a noble. I am a senior citizen. I'm on fixed income. Can you tell me I'm going to have to find five hundred dollars more to pay my taxes? That scares me. But I also wonder why you're building this for preschool and K. Because that's not a requirement in the town in the state of Massachusetts. So maybe someday. Yep. Yeah. But we need other things in other schools that are required and needed now. Yep. Yeah. So I'm going to take the first piece of that and then let Mr. Swenson take the second part. So the tax piece. I completely appreciate that our senior citizens will not fixed income. There are programs in the town that we've asked Mr. Dutton to advertise that folks can apply for. Um, one that I know off the top of my head is the SAVE program. That's where senior citizens, senior citizens can volunteer uh, in town, in different offices, where they could offset some of their tax, their tax dollars. So there are programs out there, so thank you for asking that question so I can throw that out there. Um, so for anyone who does feel like they might need that assistance, the town website does have that information on there. Um, so please feel free to check that out. And Mr. Swenson, the second part. The, uh, first of all, our preschool is not a traditional preschool. It's an integrated special, special education program where we identify students at age three who may have significant needs that we uh, need to provide service for. It could be uh, cognitive disabilities, it could be physical disabilities. So it's not a traditional preschool like some of the early learning centers that you see in the around town. We are mandated by the state to provide services for that for those students. So it's a little bit different than a traditional um, preschool program. It is a special ed program within our district. It's a regional program. It services students both on both sides of the district. We also bring in typical peers as model students in that program as well. And it's a half day program, so we run two sessions, an AM and a PM session. So it's a little bit different than the early learning centers that you may see in and around our towns. Mr. Swenson, yes. if I could just add, because I know your question was that it's not required, it is actually required. We are required to provide special needs services for children Especially upon their third birthday. Yeah. So upon their third birthday, if they're referred to us for early intervention, we are required. The school district then takes responsibility for those children. Only those that are required, uh, only those that are <coughs> early intervention? No, anybody. Anybody in the community who has a concern for their child, they can evaluate. We're required to, to publicize it. Mm -hmm. And Mr. Swenson does a great job in getting the word out there. And we have screenings three times a year. So anybody who has a concern for their little one can bring them to the school for a free screening. 
And if there are any areas of concern, then the school district is obligated to provide <coughs> services for them. And then we do provide for typical students, but those students do pay tuition. So that's income to the school and to the district. But we are required to provide an education for our special needs children. Yes, it was two questions. Are preschool students now at Fort Grantingham? Our preschool students currently right now are housed at RMS. RMS. Uh, that was, that was due to the relocation, uh, due to the roof collapse. They were housed at, at that time at 500 South Street. At that point, we were just trying to find the most uh, available space. But I will tell you that population, that site currently, Rainier Middle School does a wonderful job. And I know we have administrators here from Rainier Middle School, but it's a middle school. It's not a, it's not a site that's conducive to our, to our preschool population. We're doing the best we can to, to provide them. Obviously, the services they Required, but also the facility uh, that they're required. You know, the time they have to come back here. You know that they can't go to Graham anymore. Once they enter kindergarten. Oh, so they can they could still remote there. Uh, yes. The preschool program can be housed. Yes. And, and is that what your question was? I'm saying this the students themselves. No, uh, are they going to stop their program in Graham and Bridgewater? You know, we have to bring them back, like they, so, you know, yes, anyway. So, yes, if the vote, if the vote uh, goes through, that program would then be on that site, back at that site, that uh, by the results, yes. The school, the new school, how many students is that being built? And what's the projected enrollment now? So the building is built based on an enrollment projection that MSBA gave us. So we got an original number uh, 740. It was 740, the original number, and we pushed back at MSBA and said, you know, we've got a lot of development going on in town. We that's not that's not realistic. So we pushed back. Mr. Swenson pushed back, and we they pushed it to 775. So 7 740 is 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 K to two, right into right. the preschool kids. So so the school is built for for. 860 kids over there, the pre-K, K, first and second grade. Okay. The enrollment agreement, and, and there was an agreement between the, the district and there's the MSB right. didn't give it to, to the district. There's an agreement that was negotiated, but it was 740 K to K to 2 K. That so right. it doesn't include pre-K, pre-K is included in the reimbursement from the MSB. Is that enrollment now, if it was to open? They were to go to school this year with yes. 740 students from K to grade two. So again, it's 740 K to two. K to two. Yeah. It's 740 for uh, K, K to two, right. not pre K. I just want to just want to transportation find going out to the senior center and on the golden street. Yep. We, so. We'll, we'll take that question too, but what does this one say to the first if we get, part? If you get the projection numbers, I would just say, as Mr. Um, Dolan stated, there's a formula that MSBA uses um, based upon live births and a lot of different factors. One thing that they did not take into consideration is the pulling of building permits and things that we all know living in the community are happening. So, I used to work in the office, so I know about okay. it. So, as Mr. Dolan said, I, I pushed back. I, you know, we push the fact that we have a lot of houses right now that are currently under construction that are, you know, these $150,000 homes that are not going to become to nesters, build it and they will come, they're going to bring children with them. So when we did bring that information to MSBA, they did um, give us a little bit of a bump in increases right now. We currently have about... It just seems so, a lot yeah. from the picture. Mr. Right, we got 10 sections. Ten sections currently uh, of each grade level. Um, this school has eleven sections, so eleven classrooms built in uh, for for that increase. Should should it come? So to address hold on one second, sir. The question about the senior center and buses. So they'll be exiting only twice a day, and it's only exiting when the buses go out that way. They will be forced. Yeah, I'll uh, get that. They'll be forced to make a right. They will not be able to make a left. We have the ability as the school district to say to the bus company, no left turns on Bedford Street. Everybody has to go right. When you get down to Winter Street, where there's a traffic light, you can go left or you can go right. 
at a traffic light where it's safe to do so. Right, so you'll go left or right and then circle back towards the center or head back that way towards the other side of town going towards Alex. Um, and there will be a gate. There will be a gate at yep. that at that um, exit way that will be closed after that, so that pet folks can't use that as a pass for uh, for one day. Oh, I'm kind of kind of yeah. I'm kind of interrupting, but I know we we as the designers and, and the, the group, the school building committee, spent a, a number of meetings with the senior center. Um, so I just want, you know, I'm not going to change anyone's mind here, but I, I just want people to know that um, uh, the there is money in the budget to actually kind of formalize or improve the road, put curbs in, and, and for, you know, right now it's kind of a free-for-all when the people are going to or from the senior center. So, you know, we'll be putting curbs in and, and people will go certain places, there'll be stop signs. Um, and we really want to slow down traffic. But the other thing is with the buses, as Derek um, said, there's, there are going to be gates. It'll be 20 minutes in the morning that they're leaving and 20 minutes in the afternoon. Uh, but there'll also be like speed humps, not little speed bumps, but things that actually slow the buses down. And, and part of our discussions with the senior center was that when the afternoon dismiss, dismissal occurs, um, the senior center activities are actually over by that time, so there shouldn't be any conflict. Um, and in the morning, that's why we put curbs and stop signs. That that there may be in in the morning, you know, some seniors coming in trying to take a left while the buses are going out. I just want to. I know we spent a lot of time on. Uh, yeah, Michael. So, uh, yeah, Jeff. Can I just maybe go back to her yep. prior question? Yeah, yeah. I don't know. Did we have a state what the involvement is? Oh, okay. it's so, yeah. <laughs> I just want to have to get that. But I don't know all that. Yeah, I don't know all that. Mr. Gray. Okay. Okay. But your pre-K, young K buses, that's all five. Vans. They take vans. Yes, vans. vans. Right. right. Yeah. And the vans will come in and exit as in the not in the not the exact parent loop, but they'll come in South Street and exit South Street. I don't know why the buses can't do that again. Because of traffic. They did it with 22 buses years ago. They absolutely did. And, and they have an yeah. on the number of buses now that they can fill up. Uh, I want to, hold on one second. Oh, hold on, sorry. He had a, he, yeah. He, he, yep, go ahead, sorry. Uh, I think the gentleman asked a question. Uh, I didn't give the answer to that. Earlier question was the, the current year enrollment numbers for pre K. K 1 2 is 750. I don't know the preschool enrollment numbers. Yes. I, don't, I don't have the. So, so we're, we're already close to the numbers. Yep. That's why we've tried to push back with uh, MSBA. But we do have flexibility on the site should, should we need to uh, increase another grade level. That's what we're saying. Right now, we have them in 10 sections rather than the 11. Do you, can, can you explain sort of their rationale with the, that that number they came up with based on the current numbers? It, it just, just sort of ties a lot of, of, of SBA's projection number. Yeah, I, I'm, I'm not sure. It's not something we're, we're, we're involved in, but they do. <coughs> so they look at the, the, the population, the demographic, the sure. age demographic. Sure. I'm not, I'm not sure how they come up with that stuff. No. And, well, the concern that I have just hearing the numbers as a taxpayer. I hate to have this project move forward. I know something has to be done, but I don't want the town to come back to us, the school come back to us five years after it's been open, say we need more space because we're running out of space. We do have, I would say this, we have we have some spaces that are built in currently. Um, well, as we just stated, we have 10 sections of each grade level currently. Each grade level in this site has 11 sections of each grade level. So we have some flexibility there. So we've had about three extra classrooms there. We do have the ability to, at that point, take some of the existing classrooms that we have utilized for other reasons and create those as traditional classrooms as well, uh, if need be. Again, we're inheriting the numbers that MSBA is giving us. That's why I then went and 
pushed back to them and stated that you have to take into consideration things like building permits that have been pulled or homes that are currently under construction. So, uh, you can start taking other areas that are currently used for something else and you're robbing either the yes. equality is creating other yeah. Okay, thank you. Uh, hold on one second, we've got a bunch of questions. Yes, you were first. I just wanted to ask, has there been any feasibility study about putting a traffic light on the street? Why do you drive away so that the buses could go out there and go left and right? So because it's a state road, that would have to be something the state does. Yeah. Uh, and that's out of our scope as a, as a, as a uh, building. You have to ask them to do this. I'm on the JCC. Okay. And the town has to. Hey, no, no, to the JTC, to the city, to the feds, put a traffic light in. That's where it stops. It takes 11 years. It takes 11 years to get to it. Okay. Uh, yeah, hold on one second. Yes, sir. Yeah, so this is a construction project. We know there's change orders along the way. Like, what level of overage has been budgeted for, you know, overrun some change orders? Uh, so, so we're now in a contingency. Yeah. So, yeah. so within that contingency, it's it's near construction, so we carry about five percent. I can't remember exactly. It's about five percent of construction for construction overages, and then there's what's called an owner's contingency for unforeseen and the, the south cost of it. And we have heard the question: What happens if you go over? We cannot go over that number. It's, the agreement with MSBA is that's the number and that's it. So if we do go over, we have to pull rollback to get back to that number. So we are held to that number by the state. So we've heard that that comment made many times throughout the past month and a half. You're going to go. We cannot go over that number. It's that simple. Uh, yes. Hi, um, this is a question for the actual town itself. Um, what, <laughs> I, sorry, yes, <laughs> sorry. No, no worries. You know, we're talking about enrollment and new builds and all the kids coming. Of course, we want to be welcoming to people coming into our town, but have we thought about or debated or looked at options on halting building permits being allowed, or developers being allowed, or making it more difficult just until we're past the stage. I wouldn't be able to speak to that directly. I can totally follow up with the town manager and get you an answer. I know that we were in a bind because we weren't at 10% from um, an affordable housing perspective. So when people would go to the state and put in 40 Bs, we couldn't stop that. So that's how we got access. That's how we we're getting their new development. So there's things that we could not change from a town perspective, but now that we're at that le that limit, there's definitely contingencies that we can talk about from a town perspective and see if we can put in place. But I don't have that full answer for you today. Okay. And while you're standing, I'm sorry, I have another question. <laughs> there's also another counselor here, Mr. Wood, <laughs> <laughs> um, that might be able to help, but go for it. I'm here for you. I'm sure that you've seen um, Easton's um, Board of Selectmen um, Put something, well I saw it on Facebook, so I'm sure you guys have seen it on a much higher level than me. But they're offering um, additional resources and tax reliefs in addition to their already existing plans. Like you said, we already have plans in Bridgewater that you know anybody can go and look up and so forth. Mm -hmm. Two comments on that. If it's if it's that visible, is it? Is it on the building um, school building project? Is it does everybody feel that we all know what that is? Mm -hmm. I'm not sure it has anything to do with school building. There is a somewhere tucked in the town. It does talk about the same program. Okay, so my my point to that is, if it's tucked away, right, and taxes are one of our biggest concerns for everybody, not just you know, not just senior citizens with all due respect, but veterans no, and anybody young. with with hardships, right? Mm -hmm. I think we might want to consider making that more obvious. We, and talking about that. We talked about that on Tuesday at our town council okay. meeting that we had on the first. That will be put to the front page and folks will be able to get all that information up front and quickly on the different options that they have to abate their taxes for this actual project. Okay. So we, the town manager is fully aware of that and we should see updates by next week. Okay. Um, he said by the end of this week, but 
by next week, we should totally see that those things out in front. So when folks do come to the website, they can see what to do. And we should post it in other places, not just the website, because I know some folks don't use it. Yeah. So we'll be sharing it in other areas within town. Gotcha. So then related to that, I'm sorry. Yes. Yeah. So sort of building up to uh, right no, the question. No, no, I'm no, sorry. No, 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 laying the foundation here. Sure. So with that said, the way that I understood what Easton was doing is that they have their established tax reliefs like we do, mm -hmm. but they are going to communicate or, or vote on or discuss additional tax reliefs and options because of these additional um, taxes that are going to hit their town based on their building projects. Okay. Is that something that we can consider? Is that something that we can explore? Is that even a reality? How does that work? I think we can always explore. I'm not as familiar with Easton, um, but we can take a look and see if that's something that we could do from the town and then present it at the next town council meeting on the 15th. Okay. Um, and we'll have an answer for you then. Okay, that'd be awesome. Because we always talk about thinking outside the box every time too, right? So I just yeah. think that we should keep on that. Thank you. If I may clarify, I am a senior citizen. I'm looking at this from a senior citizen point of view, but not everybody in this town has money. Yeah. Not everybody, young couples, don't yes. have the money. Absolutely. There are many others, so yeah. it's not just the senior yeah. citizen. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Absolutely. Yes. Okay, two quick questions. On the soft cost side, anything in the old school is going to be reused, or are you just going to totally implode it and pat it away? So, as when you say yes, any learning materials. Okay. Yeah, I wanted to clarify what you were asking. I wanted to drill down. So that stuff was moved to 166 Mount Prospect Street when we had to move those students from 500 South to there. So that stuff was moved. Not all of it could be moved because, frankly, there wasn't enough room at 166 Mount Prospect Street. So just to, to lay that foundation for you, there isn't a lot left. Um, the stuff that was at 166 Mount Prospect Street for the middle school was brought to the Williams for those students, that were, the seventh grade that was put there. Some was brought here for the eighth grade, and then some was put in um, 500 South Street as a, as a storage location. So that stuff will be taken out. We won't implode it. It looks like everybody's totally done their homework. You've got everything, the numbers collapsed, raised. Everything looks good that way. But in six months, a year and a half, what's the next thing the town's going to say, oh, by the way, we need this now? So as a school building committee, we can I can't answer that question for you. That would be something that you'd have to ask the town manager for um, that question. Unfortunately, you couldn't make it. So that's why this is locious graciously stepped in and answered that question, but I, that would be a question I would refer to Mr. Dunn, absolutely. What I can say about what the town has coming up, we need a new fire station, we know that. Those conversations have been happening for a number of years within town, within the town council, so, and they also have, we also have a, a comprehensive list of the things that are happening. We're going through a whole prioritization plan right now, so I, welcome you to read some of that, but we will. We have been talking about what's coming up down the pike, and we'll be sharing that from roads, from Flag Street to Cross Street to the fire station to many other projects that are cost multi-million dollars. Those are out there, and we're aware of it, and the financial department is looking at how we can mitigate those costs as we go forward and how they'll be budgeted for it. Yeah, it's a shame that you're still paying on the old school and you're not Absolutely. From the school building committee standpoint, we understand that pain and we agonized over that for at least three meetings um, talking about how much was left on that bond were we actually going to knock down a building that actually still had money out of it and when you saw the ad rental number versus the the new it just didn't it didn't make sense to but i get it. i get that frustration believe me but it's going to be hard to say, oh, uh, let's vote yes to the school, and then, you know, like I said, six months, a year and a half, and by the way, now we need this, and there you go again, you know? <clears throat> so. Yeah. So, a couple of Mr. Wood. A couple of questions. One, confirms the seniors, no buses, with no traffic, with exit to Bedford Street from 500 South Street. We also promised when we built the East Side Fire Station, we promised the West Side Fire Station, 
for them to take over the forest. I find four problems with the current building that you people want to put up. You say there's one entrance to the building. Secure. I understand the teachers are parked in the rear. They all have their own entrance. That makes two entrances. And if you get to the gym, that's the third entrance. So other than yep. school time, there are other ways of getting into the building. OK, the buses go out the back. I'm not sure from what I can see, I can read of this here, that the problem with the elevator, there's a problem with the teachers coming into the building. There's a problem if an 18-wheeler is offloading at the cafeteria where the school buses can get by them. If there's enough road space there at the time. And when the first high school built in town, 200 South Street, uh, they wanted to put it just a little circle. And we said, they're going to deliver with 18 wheelers. How are they going to turn around and get out of there? Well, we'll tell them, they can only bring a 10 wheeler in there with their fuel. And that was a big joke. So they come with an 18 wheeler, they're going to come with an 18 wheeler. So you've laid out a lot of questions there. So I want to make sure I get to all of them okay. and we address them all. So the first piece is um, promising the seniors we wouldn't go out that way. I don't know when that promise was made, but that was never part of this project. Who made it? Okay, so 1996. Okay, so I can't do anything about that. Uh, that promise was made. That 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 building that didn't happen. But we're here now, and this is this is what we have. Uh, there is one entrance in and out of that building that the general public would use. Teachers have card access, just as they do in all of our other buildings. They have card access and can get in other doors. They're employees of the building. They have that access. Um, that, that answers that question. I don't know. I'm not sure I understand. What's, what's the door? What's that? Where is the door? I'll be out there. Um, uh, well, the elevator is in the part of the building. Right. Yes. Yeah. Check the doors. You're going to have two doors on the elevator shaft, on the elevator itself. Yeah. Um, Look at the diagram. No, I know how to do elevators. So the one one side of the elevator will have a door on all three levels, and um, I want people to understand that this is about 10 to 15 percent of the of the way through design. There's still almost a year of design to go in this building. And the last thing is we did talk about uh, deliveries to the rear of the building and the 18 wheelers. We looked at all sorts of ways of trying to accommodate one and maybe get it to turn around and go out back out um, the way it came in. Um, what it came down to is that the district has control over when kids are using the back of the building outside and when deliveries take place. And that's a management issue. Um, also, a lot of the deliveries don't come from the 18 wheeler. They, they come from the high school in smaller box trucks and those trucks can turn around and go the way they came. So I just wanted to give the facts on that stuff. Did that address all your questions, Mr. Woods? Basically, yeah, okay. except for the elevator. Okay. So, so, so you, 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 it is actually, so an elevator can't kind of have two doors, it's called a corner post elevator. No, let me explain what the drawing shows. I, I just checked. It does the basement show. comes out that way, second floor comes out that way, the third floor comes out that way. Right. So this one in the middle has to, as a janitor supplies in the way. But yeah, it's called, it's called a corner post elevator. Get rid of the You can have two doors in there. You can't have doors on multiple sides of an elevator, Jack. I said that's why I brought it up. Okay. In there, it's on multiple sides. Thank you. Yes. You say you have one entrance. Yes. Five. Yep. Ma'am, I'm just going to interrupt. Control yep. entrance. Right. So, 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 so we have to go outside. Teachers can 
the outside of the key. So if I don't have to happen, so you're going to find their key? No, no, it's all part of their ID. They all have IDs. Yeah, they all. And if you go into any any one of our buildings, the teachers all have their IDs on, and those IDs have have a swipe. So they don't need the ID to get out the door. Right. Yep. 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 Or not cost of the, the children uh, on these new houses that are going to be built in apartments. Um, are you going to limit class size? Because this is a crucial age, pre K to two. They say class size should not be over a certain number. Are we going to, you know, keep out the class size? If the class size has been designed around 20 to 22, we try not to exceed 25 at the early, at the, uh, do the best we can at the, the earlier ages, pre K two. Try to keep it under 25. Okay. I see it says Harris Health Office. Is there only one that entire school? Um, there is one nurse's suite in the entire school, and it's in this area right here. Um, so it's near the pre K and K, which was one of the things that the district wanted because those are the, the youngest kids. Right. Um, and also, it's near the main entrance. So if there's a sick child, it's, you know, Convenient for a parent to come in and pick the child up. And, like and the, if I may, go ahead. the um, nurse health office will have a bathroom in it, yeah. and it will also have several beds in it as well. So it's not going to be like it was at Mitchell, where there was no bathroom. Well, the main office, they had a health main office at Mitchell. With yeah, that, that was the three years. All the teachers would say, it's too far for them to walk. Mm -hmm. yep. So, I mean, I can't see it. So, again, I want to, yeah, I, so I want to reiterate, this is, as Jean said, this is a 10% design. And we have, that's when we have to submit it to MSBA. And that's when we have to submit it for a vote. So we still have, as Jean said, another year of, of moving things within, um, playing chess and checkers within the building of what what we want where and do we make this smaller, do we make this bigger, uh, that those types of things. So we hear that, we get it. Um, but where is the main office? So the main office is this pink area here. The office, the is the administrative suite. Yep. So the nurses there, the counselors, the assistant principal, the principal, um, the secretarial staff, they're all right there at that main, the main entrance. So you don't have to go far to, if you're coming in. Uh, yes, Mike, just to, for yep. informational purposes, um, I know we talked about what a no vote means financially and for the program. I just, Dr. Swenson, or Mr. Swenson, sorry, if you could just discuss what a no vote means for your district. I think that's an important informational thing to get out there. Well, uh, a, couple, a couple of things that we have to talk about logistically. First of all, we have a regional agreement with, uh, between the towns of Bridgewater and Rainham. There is currently an emergency clause within the regional agreement that states in an emergency situation, we can relocate students to any building within the district. That's what we've done here at the regional high school, putting the eighth graders up on the third floor. If it is a no vote, the town of Rainham is then going to view it as the emergency is no longer in place because Bridgewater then has made their decision that they don't want to move forward with the school project. Now, we've already had those conversations with Rainham. They're going to allow those students, obviously, to remain here for this school year, but the expectation will be at the start of the 2021 school year, that the eighth graders that are in the only truly regionalized building in the district are going to be relocated. But Rainham, over the years, never allowed any regular students, one, two, uh, well, the, when the middle school opened, they had so many students, and we had five and six at the middle school, <coughs> very much overcrowded. Yeah. That's, that, 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 that's, a, that's a little bit different because the way the regional agreement works is that students K-8 attend the schools in the community that they live in. 
So it's a little bit different than, there are different regional agreements throughout the Commonwealth, but that's the way that ours are set up. The high school is the only truly regionalized building in the district. This is where 9 through 12 Bridgewater and Rainier students attend. The K-8s, again, you attend the town in which you reside, okay? That's just to have a regionalist agreement was designed well before I stand before you here this evening. Okay. So with that being said, we need to relocate those eighth graders. So it looks like the plan that we are going to probably have in place is that we will most likely take those eighth graders, move those students to the Williams Intermediate School, take the fourth graders, move them to the old high school, and then at that point, what we would actually have to do is move our central offices out of the 166 uh, prospect site and probably move here to the um, high school. It's going to be, I will tell you right now, walking the buildings like I've had since the beginning of the school year where it's already very tight in those buildings to put the eighth grade down at the Williams and have that become five, six, seven, eight building, which is really was um, designed for three grade levels when it was the intermediate school. It was a um, four, five, six. You're putting another grade level. You're now taking about another 250 fourth graders, putting them over in that site that already has close to a thousand students over at the old high school in a site that is not conducive to an elementary school population. A couple of concerns I have with that is, again, the site's not conducive to an elementary school population, but if anyone drives on Mount Prospect Street, or Center Street, or South Street in the morning, during drop-off at that Mitchell, now put another 250 students into that building. It's going to be very difficult. What's also going to be difficult is when we have to move our central office to this site, we're probably going to have to take over the guidance suite here. That impacts the high school. Now those high school guidance counselors have to find space, which would probably mean taking space away from our department heads. So there's, there's a real big ripple effect here. And I am really concerned about, first and foremost, uh, from a safety perspective, having a lot of students in a building that, again, if our population continues to grow, where are we going to put students eventually? We're already uh, maxed out at the Williams Intermediate School, having the seventh grade over there. Mr. Kaler, Mr. Hines is here. We had conversations early in the budget season last year about putting some additional teachers um, to the seventh grade staff. One of the major concerns is we didn't have a place to put them. Every space is pretty much being utilized. We have special education teachers currently doing pull out of instruction in what used to be supply closets. So we are we had to build offices this summer for our school adjustment counselor that we needed desperately over at that site. So it's a plan. It's not a great plan. But I mean that if we have to go in that direction, we are ready to do so. Uh, but it's a lot of transition. It's going to be a lot of um, hardship on the Bridgewater side. And the, and the town council has asked Mr. Dutton to develop a plan for what would happen to that property at 500 South Street. So there, there's two different plans. There's the district plan, what to do with the students, but then the town has to do, decide what they want to do with that, that property. Um, so the, I, he is working on that plan. I'll look at slow to, to, yeah. to confirm yeah. that. Um, he is working on that plan. Um, I haven't seen details of it. Other questions? Uh, yes, a lot of questions from a lot of different directions. Yeah. Uh, my question is more for the architect. Um, with with the concerns and, and the ongoing concerns over mass shootings, what um, security design concepts were introduced into this new plan, if any at all? Uh, yeah, no, it's a big thing. and uh, the. We actually had a security consultant uh, as part of our team. So we had, uh, I believe it's been three meetings so far, and there'd be a lot more as the design gets um, developed. 
but with the um, police and fire departments. Um, so one of the one of the big things was there's a lot of talk about the number of entries. So there are a lot of doors on the building because you need those in the case of a fire and you need them by the building code. But the whole sequence of coming into the building if you're if you're a stranger or a parent is you know the idea of a, a controlled vestibule only letting people once they're in the vestibule it doesn't even open up into the school you have to go into the administrative suite where you get um, a badge then you're buzzed out into this lobby but this lobby is still locked so if anyone just blew through the administration suite there are doors all along here and all along here and the elevator and the stairs are behind those doors as are all the classroom uh, areas. So this whole lobby is acting as yet another uh, delay. So that's one of the big things you want to do is you want to delay, delay, delay and give people, public safety people, the time to respond. Um, we also had, um, we went through things like uh, the windows on the cafeteria. They had um, a concern you know, it's, it's too late, but you know, what they kept referencing this building when you walk up to the front door, you know, the whole cafeteria is all a whole big uh, sheet of glass. That's pretty easy to see in, it's pretty easy to, you know, do whatever you want to do. So we changed the design of, of the outside of our cafeteria so that at the ground level, it's um, glass, it's difficult to see through, and the glass is very narrow. Um, and we had bigger glass up top to let the light in. So uh, we also spent a lot of time with them talking about the site circulation issue. How do you get the cars off of South Street? It's not really security, but I guess what I'm trying to say is there was a tremendous amount of back and forth and review by the public safety uh, people. Um, and then you get into the electronic systems and you know, cam cameras are fine and they're great, and electric blocks and, you know, ways to communicate. Um, you know, individual teachers can jump on their phone and tell the whole school, you know, what's going on, you know, if there happens to be an intruder in their area. The idea is not necessarily to hunker down and try to um, barricade yourself, but, you know, that might be appropriate if, if, if there's an intruder near you. Uh, but otherwise, you want to evacuate the school. So the ability for any teacher anywhere to communicate what's going on is one of the electronic systems. So, so essentially, aside from that lobby area, getting in there, the rest of the school is really on a lockdown for a second. Because, those, because they have the doors that Oh, I'm sorry, yeah, the door, yeah, they do need the doors for emergency exits. Yeah. Uh, but, you know, with whether there's hardware, you know, most of the doors won't have exterior hardware, but you know, and they'll be open, you know, there might be a handle, but they're open by that card access system that yeah. Derek's talking about. But yeah, when you get into the lobby, so you said there would be doors at the end of each hallway, right? That go yeah. into the section. Yeah. So right. those doors are always locked. So if a student does get into that lobby, they still can't get in. So the rest of the school is locked down. If he does get in, the other section is still locked down basically. Yeah, if someone like got through the, the vestibule, the admin, and then they're in this lobby, they still need a cart. Someone, they need a, they, they're trapped in the lobby. So they have to just keep trying to break barriers, break barriers, and that just gives the public safety. What, what are those doors made out of? So um, there'll be aluminum. Uh, they'll have, um, we don't have big sheets of glass anymore. You know, you break up big sheets of glass into smaller pieces. Um, certain pieces of glass are going to be like glass on your car windshield where it's laminated, you know, so, you know, if you, if you shoot a bullet at it, like regular glass might just shatter and you walk through the big pane of glass. You know, if it's laminated, you shoot a bullet through it, it, it doesn't shatter, it doesn't fall apart. Um, so. What about the doors on the classroom themselves? I mean, they'll be, they'll be wood doors. The, I mean, there'll be wood doors with small vision panels in them. Uh, I, know, I know across the street now they have the wood doors with the small panels. Yeah. Um, but the panel is like a cheap, I mean, anybody, a hamster could break that door if they wanted to. But yeah. So this will be, I assume the glass will be thicker and... 
Um, the, 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 you know, the width, of, the width of the glass is actually going to be three inches, so it's hard to get. It's it's hard to break through. It's hard to get your hand in. Um, the hardware, like it, it goes down. You you just wouldn't believe. We never had to deal with this stuff 15 years ago. But all all the manual hardware now. You know, the idea is that it's really easy. If there's an incident, someone's broadcasting throughout the school. You know, lock down or evacuate, um, and instead of the teacher having to uh, put a key in in the lock, you know, out in the corridor side or even on the classroom side, you know, they just throw a bolt. Um, there's there's doors between classrooms so that the, the hallway doors can stay locked and people can evacuate, you know, kind of behind the scenes. Um, we also, in our typical classrooms, we look at where the glass is and if someone's looking in, um, where, what corner of the room or what part of the room can you shelter and not be seen? So, it, it, it's a lot of details, but it touches so many different parts of the building, and, it, and it's a major part of what all, all schools have to do these days. When you talk about the hardware, on the inside of the classroom, when they close the door to lock it, is there any kind of additional devices that they can use to block the door, strip metal strips or bars or whatever? Um, not, not as part of the building structure, but the superintendent and, you know, you have your own kind of barricade plans. And it, it's, what we do run into sometimes is what police and fire view as um, what should be code in terms of blocking the egresses. So that's something that we continuously have conversations with them. We have a safety and security team that meets quarterly throughout the school year. And that's one thing that we've you know, kind of gone back and forth because we have tried to pilot some of these new devices um, that unfortunately have become a cottage industry uh, because of this piece. And sometimes we get a little bit of pushback from fire because they feel like it may be uh, preventing an egress uh, in a fire situation. So we're still kind of working those things out uh, internally um, with, with fire and police, but my understanding is that the design to this point, and as we said, we're only about 10% in, it doesn't have some type of uh, system like that in, in, into that. Who knows where we are a year from now if something comes out and it's, it's something that can be incorporated uh, within, within the confines of our budget. Maybe it's something we explore, but as of right now, no. So it sounds like a lot of uh, employee considerations went into this. That's, that's really something. It, it really has. We had one of our architects actually train with um, with the district staff and the public safety people. They went through and did a whole uh, week of training, uh, you know, uh, how public safety would re and the school department would, would react uh, in the case of an intruder. Thank you. Other questions? Okay, so, oh, yeah, yeah, absolutely. I want to understand, be sure I understand this. You keep saying you're 10% there, 10% out. This is going for a vote on the 19th. In the next year and a half, you are going to perhaps have to redesign this fire safety feature. This is going to change the cost, just as a first. You're telling me that mass the MSBA. MSBA. Yeah. yeah, no worries. Won't let you add on any costs. So you're going to have to take it off someplace else. That's exactly right. Yeah. Sure yeah, sure. yeah, absolutely. So if you think about your home, home budget, yeah. you budget $150 for cable. Actually, for cable, it's probably more, <laughs> to be honest. Um, so it, it, it's the same thing. So you take from one column and put it in this column to offset. And yeah, so we cannot go over. But that, yeah, so that, that's our construction budget right there, 64, 6, 7, 9. So as I said, there's you know three three distinct design phases we'll go through again. Design development, 60% construction documents, 90% construction documents. At the end of every one of those, we'll do another estimate to make sure we're, we're within that, that budget. But within that, there are contingencies built into that to allow for design development. And we're only 10% design. We carry what's called a design and pricing contingency. It's about 5%. It's built into that number right now. As the design develops, that 5% will come down until it's zero and 100% designed. 
and we also have um, labor and material escalation equivalent that. We're escalating project costs out to, uh, to a bid sometime in the summer of 2020. As we do those estimates, we get closer to bid time, that escalation cost will come down as those push costs are absorbed in the uh, So that's, that's the budget and we will stay within that. We're over budget, we'll go through a value management process to get a fact. But uh, during those three design phases, we need to do submissions to MSBA. MSBA will not accept the submission that's over budget. So we have to stay within that. Any other questions? So a couple of last minute things. We do have more of the presentations and the trifold. So if you have friends that you want to take them for, by all means, please feel free to take some extra copies. They're here. Um, again, thank you for coming. Thank you for being informed. No matter what way you vote, our job was to make sure that we informed the public. We're doing that. We are doing our best with that. Um, we have our website, our Facebook page, our email address. All of the information is there. I encourage you to email us if you have questions. Check out the Facebook page. Check out the website. And again, if you have questions, keep asking. Um, that's what we're here for. So thank you all for coming.